why don't we start um, when we uh, – we'll have a, the discussion a little bit introducing some ideas, what, the, what, what our panel does. Um, then I may ask a question that will open it up to you. When you do ask a question, state your name or in, if you want to, your affiliation as well so we know what's, what's happening out, uh, out there, okay? Um, first of all, thank you very much for all coming. Um, you have our bios in the, in the book, um, so I don't think I have to tell you too much. Uh, my primary claim to fame is I teach EMBA, the program here, and I have some star students in their classroom here, in the room here, so, uh, and I also do uh, some work in the uh, school on the areas of, of capital markets, the future of finance, and uh, what's gonna happen in the next three hours in that area, so. Um, when we turn to my left, Owen, oh, why don't you just maybe take a, a, we said a few minutes to introduce yourselves and then sure. we'll have a conversation. Um, <clears throat> I'm Owen Davis. I actually manage a venture fund in New York City which does the very earliest investing um, of teams and the, the sort of key criteria that we use where we begin at least is that you need to be based in the five boroughs. So we have sort of a very civic sort of ecosystem mission overlaid sort of on top of I have investors and they need return and they need sort of venture sized returns. So there's always this sort of constant tension between the two. But <laughs> we've been around for three years. There's, uh, you know, uh, we have two portfolios, a total of sort of 26 or 27 companies in the portfolios and uh, they're all based in New York City. Uh, my name is Teju Revolution. I'm from Boulder, Colorado, um, and um, one of the co-founders of an organization called the Unreasonable Institute, which is basically endeavoring to tackle the world's biggest social and environmental problems by supporting entrepreneurs um, who are tackling those problems with mentorship, capital, and, and through networks. So what we do is we find 25 entrepreneurs a year and bring them to Boulder, Colorado, where they live in one house, typically a frat house, for six weeks. And during that time, we bring out about 50 different mentors to work with them who range from the CTO of HP to uh, somebody who's lifted 19 million farmers out of poverty to the co-founder of Google.org. Um, and they work with the entrepreneurs to do everything from raise capital, build their business models, um, uh, figure out their marketing strategies, you know, all the aspects of running a successful venture. Um, and then the entrepreneurs have the chance to pitch to um, 100 investors to build relationships with impact investment funds to secure capital, um, get legal consulting, design advice, etc. cetera. Um, and the goal is to enable social ventures uh, to uh, financially viably meet the needs of a million people or more. Uh, so that's, that's what we're up to. And it's a, it's a real privilege to be here. Thanks so much to Bruce and to, to Lindsay for, for having us here. That was a great name, by the way. <laughs> Unreasonable. Um, thank you, Bruce and Lindsay. My name is Jonathan Colton. Can you guys hear me? So I don't have to swallow the mic. Um, and I am a member of the founding team of a venture called Catalyst Labs. And the Catalyst Labs is going to be affiliated with the Hub um, which is a home for social innovators and entrepreneurs um, around the country and around the world. And the goal is to bring together a diverse community of action-oriented thinkers and doers um, and to drive collaborative solutions for a better world. And it's basically uh, a small ecosystem of uh, hard-charging innovators. Start off um, a few bit of a discussion among ourselves, and then we will uh, uh, open it up to the uh, floor. And I will make sure we weave back to some of the questions which were posed uh, uh, early on. Um, so I noticed that the title of this session is called "The Power of Networks," and it says "Creating Opportunity Through Co-working." Um, and I just want to start off by asking you, what does that title mean mean to you? Owen, why do you want to start that? Okay. So, um, I, there are, I guess, a, you know, one is sort of the, the more sort of cliche generic answer and then maybe, you know, then there's sort of the, the counterintuitive one. But, um, you know, what we see normally um, is that the, uh, that n no sort of like 
none of our companies definitely ex exist in a vacuum, right? I mean, the mentor opportunity, uh, the role of mentorship and the role of sort of making sure that the unwritten rules get orally transmitted or written somehow transmitted to the companies um, is critical. And, you know, sort of schoolboy mistakes, uh, lessons that sort of need to be sort of known as you're starting a company are insanely important that somebody sort of tells you. You're not gonna just sort of derive it from the air. It doesn't sort of just magically fall in your lap. Saving not just enormous amounts of time, but also, you know, once you sort of have money into the company, certainly saving lots of money as well in terms of burning those times. But I think, you know, if you want to just sort of take a, a sort of higher level look, you know, the role of mentorship and the role of sort of like instruction um, is one of the guide sort of posts that we use um, a, as we view sort of our own roles in our companies. And I sit on a lot of boards and sort of work with companies very closely. Um, and I don't see it as like, you know, I don't come to, you know, a board meeting in a tie and a suit and I'm like, okay, I'm the director, right? Um, you see it as you're gonna do the very best that you can to sort of coach and sort of connect people together. Um, so that's. To me, yeah, this term, you know, the, the, the title of this panel gets at perhaps what is amongst the most important things to do as an entrepreneur. There's a uh, African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Um, and, you know, as an entrepreneur, I think th there's, a, there's a mythos around entrepreneurs, a narrative that says that entrepreneurs are these lone sort of heroes, rebels against, you know, a sea of people telling them that they can't do it. Um, but in truth, you know, no entrepreneur, um, like Owen is saying, is an island, exists in isolation, can get by, can get through without an incredible team with a very su without a very supportive network. Um, and so I think that, you know, it's, it's at the heart of what's most important to do as an entrepreneur. Um, and, uh, you know, Che Guevara was once asked, you know, how did you build this revolution? How, what, what enabled you to create this movement um, and to get at, you know, sort of, how do you how do you get people on board, right? How do you how do you um, how do you use wisdom of crowds? These kinds of things, um, you know. It's there's a temptation in this age to really rely on the internet and on social media, and I think those things are powerful tools. But I also think that there's no substitute for face to face interaction, for human contact, for deep, genuine relationships. And Che Guevara, you know, said that you know you build a revolution by meeting with one person, and then you do that again, and then you do that again and then you do that again. And you know, that's what it takes to, to, I think, also build an enterprise, right, is, um, is, to, is to just meet one person, talk to them, get to know them, see what lights them on fire, build a connection, um, and just do that again and again and again and again. Um, so yeah, it's, it's in my mind what's fundamental to being a, a successful entrepreneur. And also, it's, it's cool to see uh, t-shirts work pretty well, too. <laughs> <laughs> the power of t-shirts. Absolutely. The power of t-shirts, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's the next panel. <laughs> um, one, one of my experiences in life was uh, every time I was successful in my life I had a mentor and we were talking about this Bruce earlier on which was I had a mentor in college who I basically followed around a 70 year old man uh, who was 50 years older than me and I learned a tremendous amount from being his teaching assistant or assisting him um, and it's an invaluable experience you know and, and doing it at scale with 25 ventures has to be incredible um, um, but the other thing I was thinking about, and one of the things I'm preoccupied with is, is uh, environments where people and ideas collide. Um, and I think that's, you know, um, the idea behind, uh, you know, the hub, which is to create a space where people are co-working, so they're sharing space. Um, they're, they have a possibility of uh, sitting next to you and saying, wow, you know, I was just listening to your conversation. We're trying to solve a problem. That's a great idea. Mm -hmm. So your ideas are colliding with me. Um, sort of the downside is, is that people and ideas collide and there's sort of a, another element to starting a venture um, that I've seen time and time again where um, founders uh, fall into other kinds of, of collisions and uh, things go sideways. So, um, you know, that's the sort of the dark side of uh, ventures. Let me pick it up. There was a question about bringing people on board. Um, so it's a bit of the issues you have in any of these organizations. Um, 
So particularly in a, in a hub situation where you've got a, a space, usually it's kind of an interesting, funky space you have going on there and people come, they have various models of how they pay. I'm not sure how you're working it out in your, your operations. Uh, uh, but then this issue of who, who kind of governs the organization, who's responsible for that. So, so how do you bring people together when you've got these strong-headed social entrepreneurs and other folks uh, 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 habitating that, that space? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it's sort of TBD. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, every environment gets built, you know, piece by piece, mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a really good question that I'm gonna have to think about. Mm -hmm. Did you let me ask you uh, all a question here? There was a bit of discussion around the role of social media on this, and what I've heard so far is John talking about this fellow named Ed Schills, who was a famous fellow at. University of Pennsylvania, who got his uh, got tired of doing what he was doing, then got a law degree when he was like 60s, like that, and real sponsor. You talk about doing it person by person uh, as well, and yet a lot of people are interested in the use of social media as a way to. I guess it was the power of crowds came up as a as a question. Um, so how do you balance these things off, or is there you know what's, what is the trade off between these two these two tools? Yeah, that's that's a really great question. Um, you know, I think I think it is a trade-off. I think I think that I would, um, if I had to take a, a position, I would argue more for the relationships that are focused on personal contact. Um, you know, what we've seen, for example, we rely heavily on social media for a lot of things. Our selection process actually requires entrepreneurs to show that they're entrepreneurial by raising the ten thousand dollars that it costs to attend the Unreasonable Institute on a crowdsourced platform in small increments. So what they have to do is raise that $10,000 in $10 increments, in $50 increments, in $100 increments, et cetera, as a way of demonstrating this entrepreneurs, they have the ability to galvanize the support of hundreds of people to create a small movement around their coming to the Unreasonable Institute. Um, so last year, you know, we had the entrepreneurs who came to the Institute raise like $210,000 from 4,000 people in 60 countries in 36 days, which is remarkable. But the, you know, the observation that we made is that the vast majority of the donors to the marketplace are people that know these entrepreneurs, that trust them. They aren't random strangers or people who are just excited about the idea. They're people that had relationships with these entrepreneurs already. Um, you know, we've taken the time to build uh, social media. You know, we have, I don't know, like 12,000 Twitter followers and um, something like 7,000 Facebook fans and, you know, a newsletter subscriber list that's like 10,000 people. And that's, that's all very well and good. But in truth, you know, in terms of what that actually provides us um, in real, actual, tangible value, um, it provides us an opportunity to actually build stronger relationships with people. It's, it's through those channels that someone reaches back out to us and says, you know, what you're doing is interesting to me. I'd love to learn more. Can we have a conversation? And that conversation, that phone call, that in-person meeting, um, that's where then the magic happens. That's where someone says, we want to be a mentor for your program. We want to um, maybe connect on, on some other level. Um, you know, but it is through social media that we met a funder who gave us uh, $50,000. It's where we met people who have served as mentors at the Unreasonable Institute, you know, that kind of thing. So I would push as much as possible for people to develop true, deep human relationships with people and to use social media simply as a tool to sort of go to where the action is, to identify people with whom you want to develop deeper relationships, but not to rely on it as though it's the sort of end-all, um, you know, method through which you'll you'll build a huge network or community, if that makes sense. So you're looking for people who are sharing your passion. Exactly, so yeah, so yeah, so definitely. So the question was, you're people are looking for sharing the passion. So, you know, the question was, is your, or the statement question was, you know, you're looking for people who have a shared passion. You're connecting with them, you know, through the shotgun approach, as we say, mm -hmm. right? And then you're taking that to the next level by having that one-on-one -on -one connection, which I think has always been the challenge for a lot of these businesses, which is, that dialogue, not just the monologue, not just broadcasting, think this, do this. Right. Yeah. So, uh, the, you know, one way that I sort of think about this is the most valuable thing that, w if you are sort of externally facing, um, the most valuable asset that a company can have is a group of engaged users, of highly engaged users, right? And the idea that that is sort of the criteria um, that you're really sort of searching for, as opposed to sort of, you know, it's one thing, you see this all the time, um, or sort of, we, we see it all the time, you know, somebody says, oh, well, we have a million downloads, right? And I'm like, oh, okay, 
Um, you know, how many of those people came back? How many use it every day? How many use it every week? How many use it every month? And the idea that sort of, you know, the broad-based approach, there's, a, there's value in getting the word out, no question. But what you want to do is to sort of convert that broader group, which is, I think, what both of these guys are saying, to the, a highly, unbelievably sort of group of engaged users. And that will tell you, and it doesn't matter, 15,000 or whatever the numbers you know you want to think about, but a small group of engaged users is so much more valuable than a vast group of totally unengaged users, even if like once a year, once a once a you know six six months. So let me ask you, or just going to follow up on that. So, um, what is the sort of uh, you know special recipe for getting people engaged so they do come back? So we. we Again, we deal in, you know, it, it's interesting, We're, all of our companies are software, so the recipe is that you have a great product at the end of the day, that's it. I mean, that's how great products, you know, sort of get judged, is do you have a great, you know, sort of large group of engaged users that are growing? Um, so you wanted to have one follow-up question for you on this. You said you found someone through social media, who gave you fifty thousand uh, dollars? Can you just tell us a bit more about how that how that worked? Um. Sure, and I can you know use this too as a way to sort of get at the how do you engage right. people question. Yeah. Um, so that happened through the online marketplace I was telling you about, where the entrepreneurs have to raise money. Um, this was a, a group called the Small Foundation, which operates in Ireland, um, and they gave a couple hundred dollars to one of the entrepreneurs on the marketplace, raising funds, um, and. Uh, I recognized them, uh, you know, because I know the work that they do, and um, I was just excited to, to meet them. So when I saw that they they made that contribution on the marketplace, we reached back out and said thank you and said that we'd love to just learn about what their organization was up to, what their plans were. We didn't have any sort of intentions. We never thought that they would fund Unreasonable Institute. We thought they might fund some of our entrepreneurs, so we were excited to connect with them. Um, and in our conversation, you know, uh, I told them everything honestly, and we had a great great dialogue and they said, you know, so what are you guys looking for in terms of funding? And so I told them, you know, we're looking for this many people to give us 50K and, um, you know, this is the ideal profile of, of the kind of funder we want. You know, we're looking for someone who believes in entrepreneurship as a solution to these problems, someone who could sit down and have a beer with every Thursday because we really want to get along, someone who wants to sort of be a mentor to us because uh, there's a ton that we don't know and, you know, we'd love to benefit from people who have experience and wisdom. You know, we went on and I described the list and then, uh, and they're like, well, why don't you ask us to give you $50,000? And I said, oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so he did, and then they did, and that, that was great. But um, <laughs> we sent them a funding packet. But this is, this is a good way maybe to sort of illustrate, uh, at least in our experience, what's been helpful in really getting people on board. And um, I like lists, so I made a list. Um, of five five sort of steps that I think are really important. So I think the first one gets to what Owen was talking about, right, which is, number one, you've just got to be awesome. You've got to have a great product. You've got to have a good service. You've got to be competent, you know, all that sort of stuff. That's really important. But at the core of that, you've got to understand what you're doing, you know. In our view, and maybe this is because, you know, I, I'm not good enough to actually build a great product myself, but I have this belief that no idea is better than your ability to communicate it. You have to be able to tell someone very simply, right, in eight words, exactly what you're, what you're doing. Um, and if you have that ability to communicate it, then you're armed with the tools to light anybody you want on fire. Um, so understand what you're doing. Next is to go to where the action is. Um, so whether that's conferences, whether that's online, you know, wh where are the people that you want to be talking to gathering? How can you be there in some way? Um, the third is, you know, to identify the right kinds of people, right? Build a sort of profile, right? We want someone who's, uh, you know, passionate about X and they love kiteboarding and they, you know, whatever, whatever list of things you think is the ideal candidate for exactly the kind of engagement that you're looking for. And then as much as possible for predispose that person to wanting to engage with you. So that could involve um, getting an introduction from somebody that they trust and care about. It could involve, um, you know, one of the tactics that we have used is to send people three foot stuffed penguins with a note on them to get their attention and sort of predispose them a little bit. Um, 
And then when you make the ask, right, make the ask. Like ask them what you want to ask them very honestly. Say like, these are the things we're looking for in a person who does X. Like, do you believe you could be that person? Um, and make it easy for them to say yes by outlining the steps, by telling them exactly what they need to do. Um, you know, $50,000, da, da, da. We want you to spread the word about our, our, our program. Here, here's the marketing materials. Here's a 120 character tweet that you can use. Here's a, a blurb you can put in your newsletter. All you have to do is copy and paste. You're thinking about their needs and making it really easy for them to say yes. And the final thing, and this is the thing that will separate you from 98% of people out there, is follow up and follow through. Don't forget to send them an email as soon as possible after you meet them, say thank you, say, you know, I'm really looking forward to the next conversation. Here's when I want to reach back out to you again. Here are the next steps, etc. I think it's actually six things. Um, but in, in review, it's, you know, understanding what you're doing, go to Go to where the action is. Make sure you're sitting down with the right person who fits that ideal profile that you're talking about. Predispose them as much as possible um, to saying yes to your idea. Um, and actually, maybe we could do a really quick experiment to show you how important that is. Um, can everyone say the word spot three times? Great, now can you spell it? Okay, can you say, say it three more times? What do you do at a green light? You stop at a green light? No, you go. So this is the power of predisposition, right? When you, when you, when you get people sort of thinking in the, mind, in the frame of mind of saying yes, they're more likely to do it. No, um, this, is, this, is, this is New York where you go at the red light. <laughs> and then the last two things, you know, make the ask, make it easy to say yes, and then follow up and follow through. So those are the, the things that we've used to, to sort of really engage people that have been helpful. That's great. Let's take a few questions from the audience, and we'll come back to some questions over here. So, any any questions? And, and state your name. Okay. Do, do we have? Uh, can can you everyone hear you? Do we have microphones which move back and forth or? Uh, um, Hi, my name is Shamik. Um, I had a question for Owen, actually. Um, I'm really curious to know like, some of the ventures that you fund and also um, you know, what you look for in great entrepreneurs. And um, if you could segue into how have great entrepreneurs funded their businesses? And is it through the power of their networks? Um, in some of them you, know, you, might, you might, may not fit your purview, so um, how, how do they bootstrap and then they come to a venture capitalist, right? So how did they do that pro part of the process? Um, so most people um, that bootstrap do exactly that, right? They work on things in the evenings and the weekends. Um, we rarely see uh, individuals. Um, normally there are teams that have come together and sort of are working on the idea and the product. And so that makes sort of you know the dynamics um, and the momentum a little bit easier to sort of maintain. But in terms of you know, you don't need capital. Um, well, it depends what kind of uh, company you're starting. Um, if you're starting a software company, the capital that you need is yourself, right? That you need, you have to write code. So if you don't know how to write code, you're you're sort of stuck. Um, uh, so you got to find somebody to you know at least team up with. But capital is not sort of what you need, you need sort of the idea and you need the ability to sort of like get it going and execute on it and whatever. And most people, you know, sort of complete a product on their own that are, that are sort of motivated to do it and have a working beta um, pretty quickly, you know. Or their first version is sort of in the market, they're playing with it, they're doing it, they're motivated if they really believe in it's worth their time. So bootstrapping, there's no mystery around bootstrapping, right? That's sort of what it is. Um, the folks that sort of get to us have most likely raised money from their friends or their family, um, or they've gone sort of, or they've just sort of like worked on the side, um, you know, and, and uh, sort of gotten things going. I mean, they have full-time jobs and they haven't quit yet and they're just working on things and sort of getting it to the point where there's enough sort of momentum behind the business itself that they feel like it's a good sort of, 
you know, bet for them to sort of take the next step and, and leave. But, and then, you know, then the sort of, you know, what does capital get you? In the ideal scenario, capital gets you sort of not the ability to figure it out, but actually the ability to sort of like refine what you've sort of, you've figured out the fundamentals. People sort of that we work with closely won't give money to sort of a company. And even though we're as early as it gets, um, most of the time folks walk in and they've figured out the idea, they've figured out the product, they've figured out the market, and they're sort of now sort of ready to sort of go and do it. But they've built a product already. The, uh, Owen, I want you to say a bit more about the, uh, you, have a, uh, you have a number of, of investments. Yeah. So you have a portfolio. Can you tell us a bit more about the size of the portfolio? And yeah. Um, so we, we do two things at the fund. We have uh, a regular sort of investment fund, and normally the rounds of, that we do is they're below a million or a million and a half dollars. And so sometimes those are syndicated uh, with other firms, but they're pretty much institutionally sort of run. And what that means is that there's a real corporate structure that is set up, that there's a real sort of set of documents, there's a corporate governance process, there's a board, there's all of those things, you know, that we sort of, that go into, into place. And we run, you know, and so that portfolio, we have about 16 companies in. Um, we do, we also do something else, which is we run a summer sort of accelerator, which is we give eight to 10 companies, 20,000 bucks, and we work with them for 12 weeks, we take a piece of equity, and then they get launched at the end of the summer. And so we've done that for two summers. Um, this last summer was based on media, and we went to all the big media companies, and we had them work and run the program with us, and then we selected only startups that work in the media space, and that just ended two weeks ago. So uh, between the last two summers, we have about 13 companies in in that portfolio. Um, and, you know, those are a very different set of problems. It's a very different sort of deal in terms of like, you put the money in, it's not highly structured, you know, it's sort of, you're working very, very closely with them. But what's most interesting about that, that sort of stage is that this sort of power of sort of working together means a lot more than it does at sort of the later stages. There isn't a single portfolio company in our regular fund that's sort of gotten funded that sort of works in, in a space with other people because you sort of find that A, the interactions, there's not a lot of value to doing it. And you know everybody is like, I know that a lot of people have this view that these incubators, these companies are going to come together, they're going to help each other, they're going to trade, you know, sales leads, they're going to exchange, you know, whatever knowledge and it's sort of, I want to sort of, I, I have a sober view of that and it doesn't, most of the time it doesn't happen. Um, and I've spent a lot of time in incubators and that's because the needs are very different depending on what stage you're at. At during the summer, an amazingly tight group. We actually all are together in the same sort of uh, the same area, and it is sort of like very open. But that's because nobody knows what they're doing, and so you're just sort of like, you know, you're, you're not really directed in in many ways. You are. I mean, people have a product and they're working on it, but in many ways, like that sort of level of need creates a bond that as you move forward and you get more refined and you sort of build out the team and whatever, the team becomes the thing as opposed to the sort of connecting externally. So is there a different view on incubators on the panel? Anyone wish to come on that? Yeah, I, I think Owen captured it um, in a way that makes a lot of sense. You know, we see a real strong community emerge at the Unreasonable Institute for a similar reason. The entrepreneurs are at a comparable stage of development, more or less, and um, you know they're uh, they're not all with their teams, right? So there's an easier it's easier for them to sort of focus on building relationships between each other. Um, but you know our big focus at Unreasonable Institute, because we just do the the accelerator side of what NYCC does, um, is is two things, right? It's it's selection and environment, selecting the right entrepreneurs, the mentors, etc., and then creating an environment in which they can connect. And for us, you know, we really try to focus on like I was talking about earlier, the human relationship side. Um, and so to facilitate that, we put everybody in a frat house. 
uh, for six weeks. And we, they have all their meals together and they play volleyball together and these sorts of things. And the mentors come and live at that house as well. The investors come and live at that house as well. Um, and what's really cool about that is you've got, you've got, <laughs> you've got a, uh, you know, um, a guy who's start, a Silicon Valley venture capitalist. He's exited companies for as much as $700 million. And he's done it like eight times. And, um, and he's brushing his teeth next to a former child soldier from Liberia, you know, who's one of the entrepreneurs in the program. Um, and so the pretense that might exist between these two, if they met in different circumstances, if they met at a conference, if they were wearing suits and ties, falls away. And they build a really deep connection. And they, you know, go on hikes and they play volleyball and they cook an omelet together for breakfast. This all really happened, you know. Um, and what we've seen result from that is far greater sharing, far greater actual traction. Um, so what we did in the first year is we took all our entrepreneurs to San Francisco to pitch to like 100 investors out there. Nobody got any capital, none. Not a, like someone got $5,000, but it's you know a very small amount of money for what these entrepreneurs are looking for. Came back to the Institute, seven entrepreneurs got fully funded by uh, mentors at the Unreasonable Institute um, who they had this chance to sort of brush their teeth next to, eat meals with, that kind of thing. Um, and so, you know, we learned from this experience is that investment, you know, these sort of tractional outcomes for a lot of these entrepreneurs are based on relationships that are trusting that, you know, where people get to know um, the entrepreneurs. And we've seen the entrepreneurs themselves and the community that they build um, last long after the Unreasonable Institute, um, partially because they form lifelong friendships with these people. Um, some of them have gotten tattoos of the Unreasonable logo. Um, you know, they fly across the world to attend each other's weddings. Um, you know, and so they continue to be of service to each other, saying, hey, I need connections to distribution partners in Kenya. Hey, does anybody have uh, contacts with San Francisco investors? I'm going there this weekend, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and so, you know, we do as much as we, we possibly can to keep that going, keep that conversation alive, um, but we also want the entrepreneurs to own it and, you know, push that forward themselves. Um, so, I, I, you know, I think, I think it's just, it, you know, that's been the focus for us is, is creating that community and, and, and we um, are really happy with, with the results of it. But I think there's also a lot that we can do in terms of um, getting these entrepreneurs more tractionable resources internally, helping build their teams, because we have seen that if they don't have that community, they, they fall, if they don't have those strong team, they fall apart, so. So, so people in, in your group have really white teeth from brushing their, <laughs> their Why don't you uh, take questions? Hi, uh, I'm Balash. So my question is for primarily for Owen. Uh, so I, my startup was part of the Dream Adventures class in Philadelphia last year. Uh, it was called Launch Ups. It didn't go anywhere, but <laughs> but no problems with that. But uh, so here's the thing: the main problem we had was uh, I'm basically from India, and my business partner was from Los Angeles, and we shifted base to Philadelphia for the course of the program, right? So to sign up beta customers or to engage with that early audience as you guys were talking about, that was, real, that was a really, really big challenge for us. So at NYC Seed, the startup accelera the acceleration program that you're talking about, is there a big difference? Uh, you know, you said that a lot of the entrepreneurs are from, actually all the entrepreneurs are from New York, right? No, 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 no. no? You need to be based in New York for us to sort of get involved, but you don't need to be from New York. Okay. But, but do you see that companies that are local to that city are, are better able to engage that early audience than cities that, re, than, than startups that relocate? So I, I'm not, I mean, to engage the audience in a, in, in what way, I guess is the question. So to sign them up as beta customers. Uh, and was it and a then B2B convert company or a consumer company? Consumer company. It was a consumer company. Mm -hmm. And so your, is, is your question, do you think that like, if you're from a place, you can you can sort of like customize the the product in a better way. Is that is that the question? No, uh, that they have some the entrepreneurs who are local have some pre-existing networks that they're able to leverage. Uh, is that part of the culture at NYC Seed? Is that something that uh, entrepreneurs there work on? So, I guess that I mean there are sort of multi layers to sort of your question. Um, so on the one hand, the whole point of an accelerator. Uh, and the whole point of hopefully having a good sort of early investor is to sort of bridge the gap between, you know, you living in sort of this vacuum and the rest of the world. And how do you do that? And, you know, one of the things I mentioned that we, you know, our summer program last summer 
was in conjunction with the large media companies uh, in New York, and that was done very intentionally, right? I mean, I basically introduced all of our companies to 12 of the very largest customers that they could potentially have, and in a very friendly and warm way, so that that sort of can help bridge the gap in terms of getting that process going. But in terms of creating sort of a user base, you know, I don't believe that your user base should be like separate from, you know, is related to sort of where you're at. Like your user base is sort of looking at what you're offering, right? And getting it going, you've got to get people interested in, you know, sort of what you're doing and whether it is through social media or some kind of traditional marketing or, you know, but this is the, this is the, the impossible challenge of every single startup in the internet, consumer internet space is how the hell do you get users to sort of, but everybody has that problem. And it doesn't matter that those users, you're in one city or another city, right? It matters in terms of like how you're gonna sort of go about getting that initial user base going um, and getting the word out and connecting with sort of the folks that you're gonna need to sort of connect with to make sure that what you're doing is gonna at least have a shot as a beta. Could you pass the microphone behind you? Hi, <clears throat> good afternoon. My name is Jamie Gonzalez and I'm a master's student at Arizona State in the social justice and human rights program. And my question is for uh, Teju. Um, the question is regarding the diversity of your fellows. And I'm just wondering how do you recruit and our market to the most uh, marginalized populations? Um, and um, given the constraints that they may face, um, how does the institute support them? And finally, are they uh, working on specific programs um, to help their own communities? Sure, it's a, it's a great question. You know, when we first started the Unreasonable Institute, we um, just sent emails uh, to people who were potential candidates. We sent um, an email to, I think, like 3,000 potential candidates, from which we got one response. Um, so that clearly didn't work. Um, and what we realized, we need to do a better job of predisposing, right, at, at entering their consciousness, I guess, through um, channels they trusted. So what we did is we built partnerships, um, which are with organizations that are hubs for entrepreneurs around the world. Um, and then we would let those partners know um, about the opportunity to apply to the institute, ask them to send that to their networks, and then in that way we got a much better response. So we've built about 140 partners, uh, partnerships around the world of this nature, um, and they, um, you know, are based in places like Uganda, and they work with, you know, Congolese refugees in Uganda, or they, you know, are in India, or in Brazil, or these other places. So that's how we try to reach out to marginalized communities. Um, you know, I think we could do a much better job of that, and we actually in the future want to bring the Unreasonable Institute to some of those markets, you know, the model, if we can, um, but that's what we're doing right now. Um, and then your next question was, how do we support them? And then the last one was, are they serving their own communities? Um, how do we support them? So, I mean, we support them in the same way that we support all the entrepreneurs, right, which is through mentorship, access to capital, and with, with networks. So, you know, those 50 mentors that come in work very closely with them. They get funding opportunities. Um, they, uh, you know, build out their boards and, you know, get guidance and advice, that kind of stuff. Um, and into the long term, you know, we continue to serve as agents for them, introducing them to potential funders and partners and, um, and opportunities that are, that are beneficial for them. Are they serving their communities? Uh, yes, actually, in many cases, they are their own customer, if that makes sense, right? They're, um, they're you know, former child soldiers serving former child soldiers or Kenyan farmers serving Kenyan farmers, that sort of thing. Yes, so that does, we see that very often. So there's a question from the audience, but before you, John, I just wanted to uh, ask you a question so you can, um, so we see these different models here. You have, the hub's a different model where you're having people come in, uh, I think, uh, depending on which hub model you're using for a longer period of time. Um, do you see any benefits from that model as opposed to this very intensive fraternity life which uh, Teju has uh, described? Fraternity, I'm sure it's already in the work as well. Well, you're right. Uh, it would. Either way. Yeah a mosh pit of creativity. Um, well, I think, you know, part of that's going to be based on, you know, how a group is inserting themselves and clustering. I think the idea is to create an environment where people are going to work intensely, take meetings, people might be coming in from out of town uh, and visiting, uh, 
there's going to be a combination of work, social, education, and media space all in the same venue. Mm -hmm. right. um, so um, part of that will be based on how each group is going to interact <coughs> and what their culture is or what mm -hmm. their personalities are uh, and how they choose to right. work and organize themselves. Mm -hmm. Do you bring in special services? Um, so here you got an amazing thing. You bring in people from Google, et cetera, who for some reason want to spend seven weeks at this place. I, I can't quite figure it well, out I yet. Should, I should clarify that they spend like three days to a week each as mentors. They don't okay. spend the whole time. Oh, that would be awesome. If they that did. would be awesome. We're working on that. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. That's a good clarification because I was wondering about that. The, uh, so, but you bring in people from outside and provide services to the group, or you just let the interactions ha happen naturally? Well, since it's you know uh, in an early stage, we've kicked around a lot of different ideas. Um, you know, I like the idea of uh, bringing in people who can augment mm -hmm. uh, what groups are working on. That's going to be based on a lot of individual needs. So, will there be resources available to them? I think absolutely. I think you know having a speaker program and a lot of other events. Um, that are going to infect the thinking of the groups that sit right. there mm -hmm. all day. I mean, I think that's the idea. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the other concept is, you know, if you build something like this, you're going to create a, an ecosystem that surrounds it right. externally. Mm -hmm. Can I just take a question from the audience? Get your name and... You stole my question, Bruce, actually. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but so sort of the follow-on on that is... Um, you Why don't you state your name so you oh, everyone sorry. knows who you um, are? I'm Lindsay Norcott. Uh, I did organize this panel, but this is not an insider question. <laughs> um, so, John. Is this the one you emailed me earlier? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, John, I was wondering um, sort of what Catalyst Labs adds to the partnership with the hub, and then what New York City you think will add to the hub, because each city sort of influences the way that the hub shapes up. And this can be fully just your opinion or your vision for how you think New York City will affect it? Well, you know, um, can you guys can hear me. All right, good. Um, interestingly enough, there are other, there are two really key people who are on the team who are not here. One is Josie Barnett uh, and Jamie Daves. Uh, Jamie's the chief visionary um, on the project, and um, the the Catalyst Labs is a bigger vision that Jamie has. Um, and the hub was a natural fit as, a, as an anchor tenant, basically. Um, but we wanted the flexibility to create um, an environment uh, that's going to combine you know, social innovators with um, people who want to fund social innovation, um, we want to have a way to broadcast what people are working on and doing and creating um, around the world to people who we've never met before. Um, so the Catalyst Labs is sort of the experimental side or the venture side of the hub, which is a fairly well-defined business model, um, and be able to do some focused and creative uh, experimentation in that space in conjunction with it. Um, in terms of New York City, I mean, you're all here and you realize um, what kind of an innovative and energetic and rocking town New York is. Um, you know, it's one of the capitals of every industry you can think of. Um, social innovation has been happening here for a long time, um, but there isn't really a hub a definitive hub, an exchange where that happens. Um, and I think that's at the center of what the venture is. Hi. Um, my name is Amira Ibrahim. I'm an associate at the Rockefeller Foundation. My question kind of goes back to the idea of, of networks. Um, so I think you've given many examples of how um, you've helped develop networks between entrepreneurs and investors, but I'm interested in the network between um, the entrepreneurs and the beneficiaries of the, the social enterprises and social ventures that you're um, supporting. Is there a way that you support um, the development between the uh, the development of a network between the entrepreneurs and the so, um, and the beneficiaries, so that um, you actually ensure that the ventures created um, do solve the world's problems and do benefit the end users. Ten, I'm assuming that's for me. Is that 
take a swing. You think? <laughs> um, that's a fantastic question. You know, I think that's uh, that's that's the goal. Um, so I would say that we don't really do that, and I wish that we did. Um, and you know, part of the reason is that it's a difficult thing to do. But at the same time, you know, you can't do everything for the entrepreneur, right? The the hope with the Unreasonable Institute is is that they can get. Um, the, you know, the kind of work that might take them done, that, that might take them two years to do, you know, done in six weeks or something like that. Um, I can't make that claim, but that would be the goal. That's what we're aspiring to in terms of raising capital, in terms of getting the guidance and advice that they need. But it is their job to run their business. And that means, you know, getting their product or service into the hands of their end user. Um, you know, what we can do is try to build a network that gives them connections to potential distribution partners, um, you know, that gives them ideas as to how to go about marketing their efforts to, um, you know, the end users that they're working with, that kind of thing. I mean, you know, the, the mentors that come to the Unreasonable Institute, one of them is a guy named Paul Polak. Uh, and he, you know, we talked about him earlier. He's this guy who's brought some 19 million people out of poverty. Unbelievable man. Um, and one of the things that he does, for example, he talks to the entrepreneurs about how to make illiterate people living on a dollar a day who don't have access to mass media aware of the product or service that um, that they're offering. And you know, one of the methods that he employed is in Bangladesh to create a full-length feature Bollywood production about a wooden irrigation pump um, that his company developed to give farmers the chance to um, irrigate their fields during the dry season when there's no rain. Um, and it worked great. You know, it was a story about a, a boy and a girl falling in love and, you know, she got kidnapped because, uh, and then, they, and then and charged a ransom and then the, uh, the groom had no idea what to do so he came across the treadle pump, the device that this organization was selling, used it to make more money from farming, pay off the ransom, they got married. And there was an intermission in which they brought traders with the actual treadle pumps over. People got on the pumps, they were using them, these kinds of things, and they were like, wow, I, we got to buy one of these. Um, so these kinds of tactics that, you know, we, sitting here in Boulder, Colorado, or New York, you know, wouldn't think of, but people with on-the-ground field experience would have. Um, and so into the future, that's very much something that we want to do. And that's exactly, I think, the right question to ask in terms of how we prove useful for these entrepreneurs in the future. I just want to jump in. You know, it's funny you call them sort of beneficiaries. And, you know, in from my lens, I would call them customers. And ultimately, the job of the entrepreneur is to find, and without being sort of too, sounding too cliche, the product market fit. Like, that's your entire job as an entrepreneur, that you have a product and there's a market and they have to meet. And that's what makes a great product, that a product that is able to sort of meet a need or create a need, either one. So I feel like the, that sort of like goes hand in hand with sort of being, if you're going to be a good entrepreneur, that's implicit in sort of what you're doing. That's what you're searching for. Um, so that's, sorry, I have a follow-up question to my question, but it's fast. Um, so I think that's really helpful, but I, as, a, as a funder, we often um, find ourselves in that same position too, that when we fund an organization, it's ultimately up to that organization to ensure that they're reaching the market that they intend to, but it's, um, it could be incredibly harmful if we select the wrong organizations to serve a particular um, population and so while it is the job of the entrepreneurs to ensure that they're they're meeting the need do you see it as your responsibility to select the correct entrepreneurs to support and to connect to investors and to provide with resources because if not then you face the risk of supporting the entrepreneurs who are taking capital and resources away from the other entrepreneurs that could actually meet those um, the needs of those populations. Uh, yes, we do. We do see it as our responsibility, but you know, at the same time, there's no way to know, right? There's no way to be certain, and that's why what we rely on is that the uh, entrepreneurs have an intimacy with their market, right? That they really know that they're their customers. In many cases, they are their own customer. Um, you know, they're they're working with maybe the the community that they're from, that kind of thing. But there is no way necessarily to guarantee, and and we certainly aren't in a position to know for certain whether or not these entrepreneurs are, um, are, are the right or the wrong ones. All we can know is that they have intimacy with the market that they're trying to serve and that they have a logical sort of thought process as to here's the need, here's how we see serving that need, here's how we're gonna do it in a way that you know, 
is is financially viable. Um, but but you're right. In an ideal world, we would choose only the entrepreneurs that we knew right were were the right ones. Yeah. Hi, my name is Daniel Gasfriend. I'm an undergraduate student at Princeton University. Um, my question is for those of us who are not yet involved in a specific social enterprise, but who are interested in becoming involved in social business and in networking with existing social businesses. Um, do your organizations offer any type of platform or hub or service for those of us who are interested in seeing which organizations are out there um, in our areas of interest? Or do you know of good resources that do exist um, that you could point us towards? My first suggestion would be, you know, ask yourself a question. What are you passionate about? What problem do you want to solve? You know, what do you see as a need? Like Owen was mentioning earlier, um, you never make a sale unless you solve a problem. So what problem do you want to to work on? I mean, that would be my fundamental question. What do you see as a pressing need that you want to solve? And then find a group that seems to be talking in the language that gets you excited. Because if you're not passionate, don't waste your time. Any uh, other questions? This question back there, and we'll take these two, and then we'll uh, round up the panel, so, okay? Yeah, um, the Unreasonable Institute doesn't take any equity, uh, if I understand correctly, from those who go through the program, is that correct? Correct. Although we do, um, if the on, if the program was beneficial for the entrepreneurs, we do say, you know, if you want, you can give us one percent equity in your company. And some of them have taken us up on that. Do you know of any other organizations that don't take an equity stake in the mentorship or accelerator programs that they do besides yourself? Yes, Good Company Ventures in Philadelphia, um, and actually that's where we got the sort of ask for equity kind of uh, equation. They don't require um, equity, but um, they do ask for it at the end if you'd like to give it to them. Okay, uh, my name is uh, Jaulul uh, from Africa Solution. Uh, my question is, what is uh, your uh, success rate of these people you are supporting? I need the statistics about the success rate. Success rate. Yes, success rate. Yes, this is a challenging question um, because um, it depends on how you measure success, right? I mean, you can measure success in terms of how many entrepreneurs get funded. I'm talking about... Uh, uh, the people, uh, the people who get funding, uh, get uh, funding. How, what uh, percentage of them get funding? Yeah, actually, people before they come to you, they they will set a rate. Okay, I'm coming to you. I want five thousand dollars. How many people achieve that objective before? Yeah. Um, so in the first year, in 2010, 66 percent of the entrepreneurs seeking capital received it, but seeking capital. So 15 came in seeking capital, um, and 10 of them. Got it. Um, they didn't all get um, all that they wanted, but they did get between forty and four hundred thousand dollars. I'm looking at the question here about the success rate. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Sure. Do we have time? If it's a quick answer, you know. Oh, quick. Um, <laughs> that would be great. Well, so, I mean, success is not funding for us. Um, you know, success is about solving the world's biggest problems. It will take a long time before we can actually evaluate whether or not these entrepreneurs are successful. Um, many of them will fail along the way, you know, but a little bit to answer the, the question that was asked by the, the woman from the Rockefeller Foundation as well, you know, there needs to be a willingness to experiment, right? There is no, there is no success that comes without failure and that comes without a tremendous amount of failure, a disproportionate amount of failure. I think that we're gonna see you know, far more of the ventures that come through the Unreasonable Institute fail than succeed. Um, and you know, I think if we come away with you know, um, two to five ventures a year or something like that, that five years from now, 10 years from now are reaching hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people, you know, we'll be really excited about those results. Um, but yes, I think we'll, we'll have a high failure rate for sure because we're working with early stage high risk companies. So I guess, was your question how do we judge success, or? Um, or, or the rate, or um, oh. how many people you have in your business and the rate that you want to see them get? So I, I guess in some ways I would turn it around and sort of ask you why that matters. 
um, because at the end of the day, you know, every every individual situation is very individual, and um, you know, there is no sort of, you know, the idea that any company is sort of going to be part of the sort of norm or the curve is not right. Each company sort of stands on its own, very independent of sort of any other company. The correlation between our portfolio companies is zero. So um, I don't, I, I don't really, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a curiosity, you know, and it's sort of like, oh, well, how many fail and how many succeed and how big is the success and whatever, and I certainly know those numbers. And we're lucky because we sit sort of in a, in a nice spot in New York and we have very good deal flow and we have very high quality entrepreneurs and we have very high quality portfolio. And so we have a very good success rate. But in general, overall, it's tough to start a business. And for, of the people that actually stick with it and actually sort of really try to get something done, the success rate is actually higher than you would imagine. You know, everybody sort of bandies around, oh, you know, less than 1% of companies get funded. Well, that's like saying, you know, what's your view of the number of restaurants that sort of open up in New York and then sort of go out of business? But what you really need to ask is the question, how crappy were those restaurants? <laughs> so if they all sucked and they all went out of business, then that's like a ridiculous sample. So, you know, if they're all great and then they go out of business, that's a di very different conversation to have. I just want to add one sentence, which is, do we want a 98% success rate? The answer is no, because then what are we doing, right? We're not actually doing anything of value. We're not serving people. We're, we're taking bets on things that are sure bets. You know, it's like guaranteed this company's going to succeed. They've got tons of traction. They've got tons of investors. You know, what is the point of, of, of working with those kinds of entrepreneurs? You know, you want failure. You want to ensure that you're actually taking some risks. So for us, I think, you know, that's, that's the goal. So one or two, I'm sorry we can't take the final question. I do apologize for that. So I think we delivered uh, most of the questions you started out with, except for one about how do you bring people on board and improve uh, collaboration, uh, which maybe you can talk to the people on the panel afterwards. Uh, we also have a, uh, a gentleman uh, named Nathan Bricklin, who's from the uh, uh, Wells Fargo, who uh, was running an internal effort along those lines as well, and maybe you want to talk to him uh, uh, on this. Um, so what I've noticed about this panel was the following is that they're all pretty sociable people, which is appropriate for a social innovation uh, uh, conference. Um, that New York is an exciting, dynamic uh, place, uh, but if you don't like New York, uh, Boulder's not too bad either. So uh, <laughs> that sounds great. Thanks very much for a great, uh, a great talk.